Guys, welcome to the Bob Shift News. We have some really exciting things to discuss in this upload, so stay tuned, guys. You're going to enjoy it. Before we do, as always, um, I want to thank those people that have been supporting this observatory. We are now international, and we have our second data set. But before we get into that, I just wanted to just briefly talk about this picture that we're looking at. It's our, our obviously, our solar system. And what's so special about our solar system is that out of all the nine planets, and I know that they don't really uh, regard Pluto as a planet, but you know it has been for thousands of years recognised even by the ancient civilizations as a planet. So in my view, I'm going to stick with it. We'll keep it at nine planets. But there is one out of the nine that is unique, and that is ours, the fourth planet, sorry, the third planet from the sun. Um, You've got Mercury, Venus, and then you have Earth, and then Mars after that. But our planet is unique, unlike any other planets, at least at this present time. It might not have been the case many, many years ago, but it is today very unique because it is the only planet that has life on it. It has probably around 4 billion different species of life, ranging from mould, uh, bacteria, you know, to even multicellular life forms like ourselves, complex life forms like fish, um, monkeys, giraffes, elephants, a whole range of biodiversity, and that's not including all the species of plants out there as well. So, all that vegetation as well, it's a massive source of life, and we are the only planet that has that. But what is it that makes our planet unique? and able to form these complex life um, on it, on it. What is it that makes our planet special? Okay, so it's a bit like the Goldie Bear, or the Goldilocks, sorry, uh, story, you know, where she goes into the bear's cottage and there's three bowls of porridge on the, on the table and one's too hot, that would be Venus in this case. One's too cold and that would be Mars, but the mother bear's bowl was just right and that would be our planet and in this in this case uh, Venus is too hot most of its water is in a gas form um, Mars obviously uh, has none and it's too cold uh, we know it wasn't the case a long time ago and we'll get into that in a short while but Earth is at the right distance for its water to be in a liquid form and it is the only reason that we have life on this planet in such a diverse manner. Now we're going to address the secret of why Earth holds on to its water in a little while. But what we're looking at is riverbeds on Mars and it has taken tens of thousands of years for water flowing through these riverbeds to carve out those ravines that you can see. So we know for a fact that on Mars it had water but the problem is, why did it lose it? What changed with Mars that made it unlikely for it to hold on to its water for a longer period of time? One thing we do know recently through study of Mars uh, via satellites traveling over it with magnetometers on board, as I've mentioned before, is that it used to have a magnetosphere. And this could hold the secret to Earth keeping its water on its surface because when Mars lost its magnetosphere and we know it had one through studying the meteorite impacts on there you know when the satellite flew over with the magnetometer as it passed over a recent impact crater it detected magnetic anomalies in that region and it was later on um, accepted that you know Mars in its younger days had a magnetosphere it also had, as we can see from those riverbeds, it also had flowing water on there. So it is the key to holding water on a planet. And when planets lose their magnetosphere, they end up looking like Mars. Because what will happen is once the upper atmosphere um, is not protected by the magnetosphere of the planet, it will allow the solar wind to strip away and erode the atmosphere and over a long period of time the water will eventually 
boil off out into space and be blown away by that solar wind. The reason why I've taken it upon myself today to bring this information to you guys, and there is a fantastic video that's been done by Nova on the website in the Learning Center, which I would highly recommend you have a look, uh, is to, you know, bring the awareness of something that is taking place right now in our time and it has possibly the most severe and dire consequences to everything on this planet because we are in a rare time where a rare anomaly has came about once again and it's like other people have discussed you know even if this doesn't go through a completed reversal and you know as I've said before because it's half a million years overdue then you know it doesn't mean that we're not going to face implications either way it could be a terrible scenario where we lose the magnetosphere if we do the water will boil away and there won't be no um, you know there won't be that main ingredient to sustain life on this planet because no cells can form without the water being part of them and and that's probably the worst case scenario you know the magnetosphere collapsing and no more magnetosphere you know which will mean the water will boil away it will be finished uh, not so uh, dramatic ending would be or scenario would be if we went through uh, a non-completion of a reversal which means it goes to go to a reversal then reverts back to where it was if that's the case then it's still as we have been witnessing over the last 30 years going to affect the climate and we haven't saw an equilibrium yet so there is still at least 30 years for it to revert back to where it was or maybe even 100 years because it's taken 100 years to get to where it is but over over the last 30 years it has really started to knock our climate about and affect the jet streams so that would be another scenario and the other scenario would be a completed reversal where the poles reverse as it has done many times in the history but more regularly before this last one because this one like I said before is unique because it has taken more time than ever to reverse so it is looking like the first scenario the worst case but we have to have hope don't we guys okay? we don't want to know um, that our planet is going to be doomed at some point because the magnetosphere is is slowing down in the core. The core is probably solidifying, and therefore, you know, that molten, swirling iron in the centre is slowly going to stop at some point. And you know, it could be like I was discussing today, a scenario where you know we have a clutch effect where the clutch starts to bite on a car and it grabs hold of the outer tectonic plates and then cr creates a scenario of uh, crustal displacement. You know, it would wreak havoc if that was the case. So a lot of worse things are, you know, possibilities out there. And, um, you know, it could just be that we go for a reversal. And if that's the case, then, you know, we know if, if it reversed today, it would take at least another 100 years to settle down. So we know that we've still got 30 years more of this weather affecting, uh, sorry, the, this anomaly that's affecting the weather as it has done for the last 30 years. So those are probably the three um, outcomes of this magnetic reversal that's taking place. One is a complete disaster and loss of life. The second one um, is 30 more years if it reversed today 30 more years of bad weather and that will affect crops um, I mean we haven't reached the equilibrium of the effect of crops at the moment I had talked the other day that there's probably 40% crop loss in, the, in Europe uh, we know that through the floods in the United States there's been 10% crop loss these are big numbers and 10% of the output of the United States is a massive amount and trust me it will affect global prices on food and stocks um, you know I've heard you know mention of even countries like Australia um, struggling with some of their produce um, I was told that uh, we was having a discussion today with Richard who sent the data over he was telling me that um, uh, Subway are no longer going to be putting tomatoes on their sandwiches apparently because it might be too expensive I don't know whether that's the case or not but you know if it is 
you would think that Australia and the climate could, you know, produce tons of these things and, you know, themselves. But, you know, it's little things like this that we notice. One of the things I did ask uh, Peter was if he'd noticed over the last five years an increase in food prices. And he had said yes. So I think it's the same for everyone globally. You know, food is becoming uh, dearer and dearer. And the reason for that is, is it's becoming rarer and rarer. And this is the same with any commodity in the stock markets. If it's, you know, uh, if there's not a lot of it, the price goes up. If there's loads of it, then the price goes down. So, you know, it's just the way things are. So just to end it here, guys, if you want to go over to the website on the Learning Center and scroll down to the uh, Nova video, it's about 30 minutes long, but it covers a lot of stuff on the magnetic poles. And it really puts it um, into light uh, how serious the uh, case could be and you know it's got a lot of information in there as well what are the mainstream organizations doing about it they've set up a mission called Mavin and this mission is to send uh, satellites to study uh, Venus and study Mars as well because they know what happened to Mars and how it lost its water and they know that the earth is going through a magnetic reversal and they want to study uh, what is going on with these two planets with regards to why they never uh, was able to first of all with the case of Mars keep its water and its magnetosphere and why Venus is you know such a gaseous planet and what's you know what they're trying to do is work out why Earth is so special I think what they're going to do is come down to the single fact is you know when they started the mission they had a good idea of what what the secret was about Earth and that was that it had a magnetosphere and when they they found out that Mars had lost its, and you know studying those satellite photos of, you know, um, the terraform where the waterbeds are, they knew it had water. I'm pretty sure that the conclusion they made was, you know, Mars lost its water because it lost its magnetosphere. And the only reason why we've got our water on our planet is because we've got a magnetosphere. So they've set up this mission there to study and investigate further. Uh, Venus and Mars okay so guys let's get into the exciting stuff shall we now for me this was like building a satellite these magnetometers and you know spending a long time in a laboratory somewhere building them and making sure that when they arrived to their destination let's say the moon in this case you know that they would work and the great thing is is that we have the second magnetometer now online and it is out of its test phase uh, there was a couple of little teething problems with it, uh, which I'll go through in a minute. The uh, chart that you're going to see, I'll explain. But uh, yeah, if you click the link, first of all, go to Mavstar Global Data on the Pulse Shift News website dot uh, com, and then click on uh, the Gold Coast Australia for the new section of data that we've got now. Um, that come in this morning. I was up at four o'clock talking to Peter over in uh, the Gold Coast Australia. And uh, he's, he was very just as excited as me to get this data sent to me, and uh, you know I processed processed it immediately, and uh, it's now you know three hours later that uh, I'm now doing this video for you guys. So you know a bit of work been involved, you know putting the links and getting the images up onto the website and stuff like that. So let's click the link and have a look at the data. So this is the first 12-day test data collection from Perth sorry Gold Coast uh, Australia and what we can see is obviously there has been a few adjustments with the magnetometer over the last few days uh, you know to get it in a good position where we can take a reading it has now been fixed to a wall and screwed on there permanently so there'll be no more of these big steps uh, that we can see here um, what I've done is I've left the hour chart visible so you can see that every 24 hours it drops to zero again and then goes one, two, three, four, five up to 24 and then drops again. So you can see that there's just around 12 days of data being collected. Um, when the magnetometer isn't moved at all, you can see it's doing its job really well. It's, it's taking variations of only slight amounts and that's exactly how we know it should work uh, when it's not being moved. So, you know, it's now gone into its first month's test, uh, so we're going to be uh, in a month's time having a look at uh, the Gold Coast data, and you know it should be a nice, crisp, clear line. There might be some slight increases in it, 
around two microteslas or so it might be even up to five microteslas we've just got to wait and see so there's another four weeks before we pull the sd card on or around about the third of may again we'll do it and um yeah it's amazing you know it's like i said at the beginning you know it's like having a satellite that has just landed on the moon and we've switched it on and we've got the first bit of data coming back and it was like i was saying to richard who sent the data this morning to me uh, we was discussing we couldn't have done this 20 years ago first of all I'm in the UK at 4 o'clock in the morning talking to Richard on the Gold Coast of Australia and we've got a crisp clear uh, connection on Skype not only is it free it's absolutely clear so you know we can communicate really well with each other and you know we couldn't have done all this 20 years ago it wouldn't have been possible to do this 20 years ago first of all um, I don't uh, well, I don't think YouTube was even available then, so the crowd wouldn't have got together. Um, it just, it's amazing that we're in the time that we are with the technological, you know, abilities that we've got that we can do these things. And let's face it, you know, we've got magnetometers now, both in the, um, Australia and in the United States. Uh, we've got the TriMag in the UK. You know, we're up and running. We're an official uh, observatory you now, collecting data globally. And um, the only other organisations that have such a thing like that are the bigger ones, like NASA. And we've got our own private little independent observatory. And it's funded by you guys. And the nice thing about that is, is that you're getting every bit of information that we collect, good or bad, you get it. Now, I could have, with this data, and I didn't want to do that because it's only a test in any case, I could have cleared up the... Um, the uh, you know those anomalies where it's been moved a little bit but I didn't want to do that like I say I wanted to show you what I got um, I could have filtered just this section here where it's smooth and there and perhaps just took these readings from here to there and showed you guys and that would have been good enough to do that because we could see that over that period of time it hasn't shifted much but there are if you look closely some little movements of it going up and down and we will focus on this a little bit more clearly when we uh, get the next data packet in. I'll be able to drop the range of what the chart's reading on the left-hand side at the moment. It's from zero to 160. Uh, we'll just have it focusing on where the lines are like we do on the magnetosphere uh, charts. But I wanted to show you how I got the information because this is all about the learning curve of putting these magnetometers out, uh, making sure that they, you know, they're bringing the data back and that's the main thing here we've got 937 readings in total every 15 minutes over 12 days near enough and uh, you know it's working and we can clear up these little uh, you know uncertainties uh, along the way the fact is that we have something working the data's coming in and you know there are lots of possibilities uh, what we can do to clear up the data uh, with Excel and filters so Guys, I'm going to leave it here. Um, you know, guys, the links are down there. Um, support us on PayPal. Support us on Patreon. You know, it's how we carry on doing what we're doing. We've got two uh, data sets in now out of the four the, of the magnetometers that have gone out. I spoke to Jeff uh, yesterday by email. Um, he's told me that he hasn't received his magnetometer yet. It's been two weeks, so there's still a little bit of given time there for him to receive it. I said, um, if we haven't got it by, you know, perhaps uh, the end of this week, starting Monday, I'll investigate it and look into what's happened. But I do know if there's a problem with the address where it's gone, it can come back to me because it's got the return address on it. So, but, you know, we're not at that stage yet. We're not panicking. You know, there is only two weeks. And after all, I've had, you know, stuff coming from uh, the United States, which, which has taken over a month to come. So, you know, it's, we're not panicking about losing the magnetometer yet. And uh, yeah, guys, yeah, you know, support what we do, and uh, have a look at the website as well. Uh, that video I said Nova because it's it's a good tool to get a grip on what's going on with our planet, and uh, we'll continue doing what we do. So links are down there, guys. PayPal uh, or Patreon, it's up to you. Support us. That's the main thing, really, and uh, we'll continue uh, banging the drum at this end pumping out the data as it comes in i've just got it before i go i have a word with brad tomorrow in kentucky and we should have some more data coming in hopefully by then so i'll say what i usually do guys have a good weekend and as always bye for now